Hey everybody, it's Tom, WA2IVD. Well, I never expected as many comments as I've received from that last Fuse video, and they're actually still coming in. So apparently it struck a nerve, or at least uh, resonated, with a bunch of you out there. I appreciate everybody watching it, and I appreciate all the comments. I'm reading all of them. I have not been able to get back to everybody on them, and I can't promise I'm going to answer everyone. I wanted to do this follow-up to at least answer some of the most common comments, or at least the most common themes I'm seeing in the comments. So let's touch on a couple of things. One of the more common items has been the fact that I didn't put 12 volts across the fuse. A lot of people talked about the 0.6 volts on the power supply, and why didn't I put 12 volts across the fuse or use something that could put 12 volts across the fuse? And to, to quote probably both of my sons in how they would answer that, the reason is because physics. So to help understand this, we need to quickly review Ohm's law and a little bit of circuit theory. So let's take a look at that first. I'm sorry to go all classroom on you, but we're going to have to understand some things about Ohm's Law and basic circuit theory in order to explain this. You've all seen V equals IR, the standard Ohm's Law formula that voltage equals current times resistance. Many of you have probably also seen it in this typical triangle form, and this is just to remind us that voltage is equal to current times resistance. And it also reminds us that voltage divided by resistance equals current, or voltage divided by current equals resistance. Because of the way the formula works, we can control any two of the three parameters. So if we know the voltage and the current, the formula tells us what the resistance has to be. If we know the voltage and resistance, or we control the voltage and resistance, then the formula tells us current. And if we control current and resistance, then the voltage, excuse me, then the formula tells us what the voltage has to be. Now let's look at a standard power supply circuit. This is called a series circuit because there's a wire from the voltage source to the fuse, that goes in series from the fuse to the load, and then that goes in series from the load back to the voltage source. And it doesn't matter if the voltage source is a battery, power supply, just something that's supplying voltage. In the case of these examples, we're going to assume it's a constant voltage source, at least to start out with. One of the rules of a series circuit is that the current has to be equal in all elements of the circuit. So if you've got 10 amps flowing through the circuit, then 10 amps has to be flowing through the voltage source, through the fuse, and through the load. Now, to get one of those parameters, let's take a look at the data sheet from the fuses that we were talking about in the previous video. This is from the little fuse data sheet, and on their data sheet, they tell you the typical resistance of the fuse. So if we look at the 5 amp fuse, we see that the 5 amp fuse is about 17.85 milliohms, or 0 0.01785 ohms. So if we put that into our circuit, I'm going to round it to 0 0.018 ohms here, if we have a normal operating circuit with a normal load, let's say we've got 5 amps going through it and we have a 5 amp fuse, then we know from the formula that we've got 5 amps times 0 0.18 ohms equals 0 0.09 volts across that fuse. And because the current is equal in all elements in the circuit, the voltage may not be equal depending on their resistance. And in this case, this tells us that we've got 13.8 volts coming out of our source. If 0 0.09 volts are going across the fuse, then that means the load is only seeing 13.71 volts. So the voltage that the load sees varies a little bit depending on how much current is going through the circuit. 
because the fuse is going to be more or less a constant resistance. Now let's look at the test setup that I had in the last video where I had 21 amps coming out of the supply and the load was a short circuit. So in this case the supply can't be doing 13.8 volts because Ohm's law says we can't do that. So we've got our 21 amps times 0 0.18 ohms gives us about 0.4, call it, volts, a little less than 0.4 volts. However, the resistance in this circuit is not just the fuse. This circuit has resistance that's made up of the wire, the fuse holder, the fuse itself, and any of the connections between everything with the Anderson power poles. All of those things have a little bit of resistance. So if we assume that the wire plus the fuse holder plus all the connections is about 10 milliohms or 0 0.01 ohms, and then we add that to the resistance of the fuse, that gives us a total resistance in the circuit of 0 0.28 ohms. Now if we take that and plug it into the formula with our 21 amps, that gives us 0.588 volts, or pretty close to the 0.6 volts that we were seeing on the power supply doing, during the test last week. And that is why we can't put 12 volts across the fuse in order to try to blow the fuse with 21 amps. It's just not physically possible. Another pretty common comment was the fact that if I had used a car battery or some other high current source, they probably would have blown fine. So I don't have a car battery because I didn't have one handy that wasn't in one of my cars, but I do have a motorcycle battery and we'll use that and we'll do some testing with that and see how that comes out. One other thing I did so that we could gather a little bit more data, especially when we're doing the tests with the motorcycle battery, I made a little bit better test setup to do the tests with. So I've got a place for the power to come in and it just has Anderson power poles on it. Then I have the fuse holder mounted with a couple of bolts just to make it easier for me to get fuses in and out. Then I have this section where I've got just a heavy piece of wire bolted in right now. And the burn marks there might be a little clue, but this allows me to add a load to the circuit, which the load will be a short circuit, but I can put different sizes of wire in here to see if the fuse will protect them. And then finally, I have a 100 amp, 100 millivolt shunt here. The 100 amp, 100 millivolt shunt is basically a calibrated resistor that when there's 100 amps going through it, it will have 100 millivolts going across it. So I have the sense leads on that connected to the second channel on my scope. And then that way we can see the voltage and the current when we're doing all these tests. And I've got my scope set up so that the scope probe for the voltage measurement is referenced on the return side of that shunt so the the ground for both channels is the same point and then for the voltage reference I'm measuring on the downstream side of the fuse so this will tell us how much voltage is actually across the fuse or pretty close there's a little bit of resistance in the cabling going back on the negative side, um, well, and actually in the positive side. So it gives me the voltage drop between the power supply and the fuse, but pretty close that's the voltage across the fuse. So this should help us get a little bit more data. Let's go do some experiments and see what happens. Our first test will be a no-name 5-amp fuse. We're going to use a heavy gauge wire for our load, and we're using the motorcycle battery as our power source. We plug in the battery, and you can see that the fuse blew almost instantly. We'll slow that down, and you can see the arc flash inside the fuse as it blows. We can see on the scope trace that it took about 7 milliseconds for the fuse to blow, 
The total voltage across the fuse, wiring, and the shunt was about 2 volts, and the current through the circuit was about 250 amps until the fuse blew. The voltage climbing would be caused by the fuse resistance increasing as it heated up before it blew. Next, we'll repeat this same test with a fresh no-name 5 amp fuse, except this time we've replaced the heavy gauge load wire with a piece of 24 gauge wire. The maximum amperage for 24 gauge wire inside a chassis is listed as 3.5 amps. This might be wiring inside a QRP radio or inside of a small electronic accessory that you're using with your station. It would be reasonable to protect a 3.5 amp circuit with a 5 amp fuse. Let's see what happens. The fuse blew almost instantly again, but did you notice the small puff of smoke that came off the wire? The wire didn't fail, but it had to get pretty hot for an instant. Think of that puff of smoke as a small transistor or a surface mount resistor. On the scope trace, we can see that the circuit carried over 200 amps for nearly 19 milliseconds. If this was a component shorting in your QRP radio or other station accessory, you might end up with a lot of collateral damage. Now let's try this experiment one more time. We'll keep the 24 gauge wire in place, but this time we're going to use a 5 amp busman fuse. This fuse also blows almost instantly as we plug in the battery. However, this time I didn't notice any puff of smoke from the wire. This may be hard to tell on the video, but if we watch the fuse blow in slow motion, it seems like the arc was much shorter than with the no-name fuse. The scope tray seems to confirm the shorter arc. The fuse blew in less than 3 milliseconds. The maximum current through the circuit is less than 200 amps, and it drops off very quickly as the fuse resistance goes up. This still may not prevent any additional damage to your equipment if something fails, but it will certainly help. Let's look at one final test. We're still using a piece of 24 gauge wire, but this is a longer piece with the insulation still on it. This should be a little more realistic simulation of wiring inside your equipment. We're going to switch back to the 20 amp power supply and we're going to use a no-name 5 amp fuse. Let's turn on the supply and see what happens. We're at 20 amps and just like in the last video, the fuse is not blowing. We'll keep waiting. Hopefully you can see that the wire insulation is starting to smoke. A few more seconds and there goes the wire. So our chassis wiring blew in order to protect the fuse. I realize that most of you won't be using a constant current power supply to power your radio gear, but you might be using a small portable lithium ion battery that can only deliver 20 amps or maybe even less. For me, I want to know that my 5 amp fuses will properly blow with only 20 amps of current or even less current. Well, that's it for this time, folks. As you can see from the testing, if you do have a very high current source supply, like a deep cycle battery or a lithium ion battery, something that can supply a couple hundred amps, it looks like the no-name fuses are probably okay, even for protecting smaller wiring, as long as you've got that supply to blow the fuse quickly. The place where you need to be careful with them and where you're probably better off sticking with a brand name fuse or a well-known fuse is if you're using a current limited supply, if you're using maybe solar power, a really small battery that maybe can't supply more than 20 or 30 amps with a QRP radio, any of those kinds of situations, the, the no-name fuses may or may not protect what you're hoping they're going to protect. So I guess you don't have to necessarily throw out the no-name fuses depending on how you're using them. Personally, I'm going to stick with name brand fuses going forward, but there's the data. Hopefully that answered some of your questions and there's 
a ton more tests that I can probably do on this. In fact, if you, I don't know if you can see this, I've got, I mean, I've got bunches of fuses here that I've blown doing some of these tests, uh, many that you didn't see in the videos. Maybe I'll do one more follow-up a little bit further down the road and I'll get some other different fuses in here and run some tests on different no-name fuses, see how they compare and see what I find. But that's it for this time. If you're interested in getting a t-shirt like this or coffee mug or a couple other items, there's a link in the description and you can also find that on the website. If you enjoyed the video, I would appreciate a click on the like button. And if you like the channel, please consider subscribing. And when you subscribe, click on that bell icon so you'll get notified when new videos come out. I'm Tom, WA2IVD, and this is Ham Radio A to Z.